Okay, uh, guys, uh, I think that uh, I'm going to start from our side. It is two o'clock. So uh, let's, uh, let's kick it off. Welcome everybody to the, uh, to the first in the Concrete Trends webinar series. And uh, this is the first one. We've got a uh, very esteemed uh, crowd pleaser Jacques Smith on today with a very apt topic. But, uh, but before we get into that, I'd just like to let everybody know this is now, the webinar series is hosted by Concrete Trends. Uh, it is a DMG product. And uh, we are going to talk a little bit about today uh, about the events that DMG is still, is still going to have this year. I think just for information, uh, everybody should know now that uh, the African Construction and Totally Concrete Expos has been moved out to September and it will be at the Ticket Pro Dome. And uh, so look out for, uh, for everything that's, uh, that's concrete and construction that's going to come your way. And we see that as uh, it's going to be the catch up time. I know that the, if you're sitting back and you're thinking, no, we're not going to get the crowds, you might think about, uh, guys, it's, uh, everybody's is craving seeing each other again and uh, and i see this by the overwhelming response that we've had for this webinar so that we can at least see each other even if it is just online so uh, look out in the media and then the next thing is uh, on concrete trends you are welcome to subscribe to our concrete trends newsletter so that you keep up to speed with what's happening in the construction industry and also our latest uh, issue that's issue two and uh, I don't know with the background if everybody would be able to see it, um, but that is um, issue two. I know my background's throwing it out a bit. You go onto the Concrete Trends website and you'd be able to read that online. And uh, from a Concrete <coughs> Trends point of view, you know, if you can't see your, your clients in person, at least you can see them online. And Concrete Trends is ready here to, uh, to host that for you and to put you in contact with your clients and your colleagues and, uh, and everybody online. So at this time, I'd like to introduce to you Jacques Smith. Uh, that's Jacques Smith, PR Eng. Now, Jacques has been in the industry and, and Jacques, uh, as, as the time grows, I know we say this every single time, it's, uh, it's 26, this, 26 years this year that, uh, that I've known Jacques since we've met each other and he, and he lectured to me as, a, as an engineering student. And Jacques has got a world of knowledge. And if I say a world of knowledge, I was just reminded when I read uh, Jacques' profile again, uh, the way that, um, that Jacques, you got a medal for the best student on the advanced concrete technology uh, course in your year. And then at the same time, what Jacques is doing now, Jacques is also doing for a lot of other people because that's been followed up by, um, by one of Jacques' students, Jacques Duplessis, and also a colleague today, that has also received many accolades uh, for having, uh, amongst other things, the best project uh, on the Advanced Concrete Technology course. So Jacques, thank you very much for, uh, for giving this to us today. I think this is a very apt topic. So just a few house, um, uh, rules. Uh, we've got the group chat that will be going on um, on the right hand side on your screen. So everybody's mics are muted so that we don't get the background noise as you enter. If you would like to speak, you will have to unmute that mic, but I would uh, ask you just to, um, to uh, refrain from that until the presentation is over. Also, on the, on the chat function, I know Jacques said that Jacques will be available on the chat function to answer questions as they come up, but do put your questions into uh, the chat room. Uh, everybody would be able to see those questions and Jacques will then answer those questions at the end of the presentation. So guys, uh, I know that you're going to enjoy this one and you would be able to listen with intent. So at that time, Jacques, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jan, and good afternoon to everyone. I can't see you. I hope that you can at least see me. Um, what a privilege um, to be talking to you and to all the, um, the guys who know the concrete very well. So um, for me, this is a little bit daunting as well. Um, thank you for still listening because um, the whole idea was to share a little bit of the experience. Um, Johan, the, the, I didn't get a, a medal for the ACT. My wife got the medal. I gave it to her. Um, 
excuse. And, <laughs> and, um, I was uh, I was the movement of student in the stage two um, of the ICT courses, which we now present um, the OF course as well. And I will say that a little bit later. Um, be it as it may, the idea was, and I'm going to flick through my um, through my presentation. You know, um, first of all, thank you, Johan, for for so helping so enthusiastically. Um, with this, thank you for DMG Events Concrete Trends for hosting this um, and being the platform on which we can present this. My team that's helping, and then of course for the parties in the whole court case, um, you know, that had to give an okay for me to actually put this up. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to disguise a little bit on, on who's involved and so on. The rationale behind this was planned some time ago. It wasn't, it, it happened long before the virus happened. Um, so, um, you know, the idea was to share a little bit of experience because um, not that I'm so clever, but that I've got a lot of things that I've seen and I'm, I'm thankful to the industry that's been good to me. Um, and this is sharing a little bit of that back. And this is not just one event, but in a series of events. So we will have a couple of short webinars from the same platform real case studies mostly not well documented in books um, these are things that actually happen on site uh, you see the people and this is south africa this is not um europe and you know all the other fancy stuff so this is from south african point of view um you know and um of course you know um this would also assist um you know to give you an idea um on what we do and how we present um, courses um, the ICT suite of courses um, we do from stage one through to stage four, which is the advanced concrete technology course as well. So if anybody's interested in that, you know, this is my marketing little bit as well, um, that we present them in the future, you know, we will be presenting some of those lectures also online, um, that guys, and also our revision seminars then. Um, so most of this online and the idea is also to spread this a little bit further and even up into Africa. Okay, let's get into a court case. That's what you are here for. Um, you know, um, I often hear guys that threaten others and they say, um, you know, I see you in court. And you know, my advice is always, guys, if you haven't got a lot of money, don't, don't even think about it. It's expensive. Um, you know, it's expensive to go to court. Um, you, you cannot go to court for less than 250,000 bucks. If the dispute is 250, I'm going to walk away because you will not be able to pay the advocate and an attorney and me. Forget it, you know. Um, so it, it might actually happen like less than a month ago. I was involved in a case where the legal fees um, now run at about two, twice, three times um, the amount that the guys are um, having in dispute which is absolutely stupid. And one of the specialists is also online now, um, you know, and listening to this. So you know, unless it is a really large amount, you know, you can't go to court for 70,000 bucks. You know, don't even think about that. Okay, um, in this case, 30 MPA concrete was ordered in March of 2016. Right. Um, I represented the uh, ready mix supplier. I came into this case fairly late. I think if it hadn't been for that, we might have stopped it from going to court in the first place. A ring beam in a reservoir was cast. The concrete was to be offloaded by wheelbarrow. And then all the ready mix guys go, ah, oh, no, come on. You know, you're not serious. You know, so we, but okay, what else should they do? This was a ring beam. It's not a huge reservoir. Um, you know, 16 or 18 trucks or so it's not a huge amount of concrete um so some trucks were kept on site for four hours okay we'll get back to that to the weather and so on yeah um no uh, no water was signed for this is the first things that i asked okay number one what is the concrete syringe in 35 mpa you offloaded it how with wheelbarrows uh, okay fine um you know some of the trucks on site for four hours which means they added water did they sign for the water no now, you know what, if you're a ready mix supplier and you have people and adding water to your trucks and you don't sign, then you deserve the trouble that you're going to get. Okay, that is really just stupid. So, um, sort it out. Okay, there's a picture of it. That's the only picture that I've got came out of the, um, the court files. Um, you know, I, I just copied that. Uh, but there was the ring beam in the reservoir. Okay, let's look at the testing because, of course, the dispute um, on strength goes about the testing. 
So the process control cubes were taken by the ready mix supplier and tested by the cement supplier's lab. This is in Cape Town province, your guess. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell you who that was. Okay, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, that I think says enough. In any case, the guys tested um, for process control um, cubes. They, they actually sent it to, this, to the lab to test. The engineer ordered cubes to be made by a SANAS accredited lab. And I go, okay, that's something that we can work with. Well, not always, um, not always. So you know, we run a lab that SANAS accredited. Um, I stand against other labs that are SANAS accredited that get different results. I'm um, usually different. And we've been sitting and fending for that in a couple of meetings in the past year. Um, the contractors sampled and made cubes for testing at the same accredited lab. Well, there's only one lab in the, in the region, so they send it and the lab is on us accredited. So the engineer ordered cubes to be made by the lab itself. The contractor samples his own cubes, he makes it, and then he's going to send it to the same lab now for testing. Got it. Okay. So the cement, uh, the cement lab, um, the seven day results failed. This is the process control cubes. Uh, there's always a little bit of a doubt. Process control um, is not the normal cubes that you have on site, um, you know, that they make on site um, for, for the quality assurance. But um, you know, this is for the, for the ready mix supplier to see that these processes are under control. So the sampling, of course, is different now. You got to think about what you want to do with process control cubes. Specifications say the engineer may accept that. Okay, we know the new specifications are going to change, but that's what it is at the moment. The engineer seven day cubes actually failed. Um, right, so he made two cubes for seven days and the contractor seven day cubes also failed. Um, okay, so this is where, um, where we got to hold a little bit and say, what do you know about seven day cubes? The seven day cubes um, is not a legal requirement. Um, so lots of the engineers nowadays will actually stop the project here and say, no, absolutely not, you're not going on. And I caution the guys and say, be very careful what you do because um, the seven day results would be an indication, an, an early indication of what that we might expect a low 28 day result but you don't know so um, be very careful to go and issue an instruction to remove the concrete at this stage um, because you must look at what you what your rights are um, as the engineer and lots of the engineers will say to me Jacques um, listen, I am the engineer on the site and you know, I make the decisions. I've got the right to decide this and I have made my decision. This concrete must be removed, done. Um, be careful because um, this is but merely an indication and maybe a projection of a low result that's going to come. But this was the situation that the, that the engineer faced here. Now, in dispute, somebody measures and somebody disagrees, otherwise there would not be a dispute. Somebody accuses and somebody defends. Um, so we've got the two parties, of course. Somebody pays because somebody's claiming. Somebody's got to pay for it. The main thing is this, be very careful. What is on paper is what counts. And you know, don't come with this that I will get my drivers to give us a sworn affidavit that the guys added water and so on. Remember that this was in 2013, the court case happened, 2016, the court case happened in 2019. So be very, 2018, we'll be very careful. Um, this is two years, three years down the line. So everybody's forgotten. It's only what is on paper that will count. And be very careful. What is on paper counts, even if it is against you. Sometimes there were handwritten scribbles that we had in one case a handwritten scribble from the one guy that actually swung the case around just because of the mere fact that he had scribbled that on the paper and they submitted that. Um, that was enough to say, but they were aware of what actually happened. These cases are not unreasonable doubt. It's not like a murder case. This is the balance of probability. So if you have three labs that are testing and all three labs are messing it up and they know neither one of them actually gives you a reasonable result, be careful. 
Um, because the judge might look at that and say, although all three of them made mistakes, but all three of them say about the same thing, that means that in all likelihood, um, the balance of probability says that this concrete um, didn't quite make it. So be very careful. Um, it's not about casting reasonable doubt um, over all of these labs and thinking that that's going to answer for it. It does not. Um, okay. And the main thing is this, you must realize the onus to prove is on the guy who claims. So he who claims must prove. He who claims must prove. So you've got to be careful. If you, are, um, if you want to claim something, you've got to prove um, that the concrete was wrong. And so frequently we get to a stage where the contractor will say, um, and the guys come to me and they say, but you must prove to us. You delivered the concrete. You stand for the ready mix supply. You prove that the concrete was okay. So no, we didn't have to prove deadly squat. You have to prove that the concrete was not okay. And if you haven't got the proof and you can't put it on paper, then you've got nothing. So be very careful um, with this, because if you're going to claim, then you must prove. Okay, so know your specification. Now, I put this in here because we had it on the SAMA website when SAMA still existed. Um, that's, of course, off um, at the moment. Um, but just a few, a few questions on the slump test. So if you think that you know the slump test, let me ask you a couple of questions. When a truck arrives on site, how long after the truck arrives are you supposed to sample? Well, you certainly can't leave the truck for three hours, which is what some of the guys do. How much should you sample? Can I sample from the concrete that's already on the ground? How long after um, I sample am I supposed to test? Or can I keep the sample for half an hour, an hour, and then test it? How long does the test take? How long have I got? Can I do one layer and then wait 15 minutes? Um, is that allowed? Is it not? Um, can I use the trowel and put the trowel on the slump cone and not the rod so that it's easier to see? Or am I supposed to use a rod and then look at the underside of that rod? What if the slump fails? And what are the limits? I've asked these questions of a couple of engineers and a couple of people in the industry. You'll be surprised. So I wonder how well you did um, now that we've been... So shall I... Shall I give the answers to these? Uh, okay, let me do that just so that you know that at least I know the answers. I studied it, I studied it last night. Okay, I did not tell you that. Um, okay, um, but you sample of the how long? You sample within the first 30 minutes after the truck arrived on site. How much should you sample? At least 10 liters or at least one and a half times the amount of concrete that you're going to use for your, for your test, okay. Can I sample from the ground? Absolutely not, because um, that you don't know what happened to the concrete that's already landed on the ground or whether maybe it mingled with some concrete from somebody else, a previous concrete, but you can't. Okay, how long? Um, so you should essentially sample from a moving stream. Um, you know, how long after you've taken the sample, are you supposed to do the test? Well, you're supposed to perform the slump test, most of the guys say immediately, Well, you got 15 minutes. How long does it take? How long does the slump test take? How long have you got to do it? Okay, 150 seconds, which is two and a half minutes. Um, and then the slump test must be done. Okay, can you use the trowel and not the rod? And the answer is yes, you may. When you put the trowel, it actually gives you a nice straight line on which you can measure the slump. What if it fails? Then you repeat the test. Even if it isn't um, a sheer slump, you're supposed to actually do it again. And if it then passes, then you accept the one that passes and not the one that fails. Okay, it would be stupid to do it otherwise. Um, what are the limits? The tolerances for the slump is plus or minus oh, 25, up to and including 100, and then above that, it is plus or minus 40. Well, for the very low slumps, there are different limits. Very few people work in that um, sort of a range. The maximum slump, 175, the minimum 5. Um, which is something that a lot of people don't know. So be careful if you specify a 200 slump. Um, you know, it's out of the specification. Okay. A strength investigation. Normally, we do a strength investigation if there are low results or no results, which is what we've had over here. Um, we had a matter of um, very low results. Um, you know, and if there's no results, then you have to manufacture results or at least come up with some sort of wisdom. But just understand one thing. 
if I see a test um, that fails, then I say it's one of two things. Either the concrete is underperforming or otherwise the test is underperforming. And infrequently, it is the test that is underperforming. It's, you know, the concrete frequently is performing quite well. Now, let's just get one thing straight that you understand. If I get two results, this comes up later in the presentation as well. If I get two sets of results and they vary, the question is, which one is more likely to be right? Because we had that in a case um, on a site in Cape Town not too long ago. Which one should I accept? And the answer to that is, if you make a mistake in your testing, most of the mistakes that you make will give you a lower result. Very, very seldom will you get a mistake that you make that'll give you a higher result. In fact, if I took a cube and I give it to you and say, can you test this cube for me stronger than what it's worth? The answer is hardly. I could hardly do that. But if I give you a cube and I say, can you test it for me lower than what it's worth? The answer is yes, I could do that in a number of ways. You can fix the plate then, you can put it um, you know, out, of, out of center. Um, you, could have, you, know, you could have a cube that is out of measure, out of square. There are a myriad of mistakes that you could make. Um, yeah. But the one that is the higher result would be more likely would be the one that would be more accurate because you've got a much better chance um, that that would be accurate simply because of the fact that you cannot test the cube more than what it's worth. You can hardly do that unless you cook or crook. Okay, you can cook the cubes, yeah, or you can crook them, that is easy. Um, <laughs> but unless you do one of those two, um, okay. So for the cube test, so let's just get this one straight. Sampling is important. You must sample from a moving stream after the first 10% has left the truck, sample from a moving stream, no one hold the wheelbarrow there and fill it with concrete and then take it away. That's also not acceptable. You're not supposed to do that. Okay, you're supposed to compact it properly so that at least, you know, and there's a reasonable um, measure of, um, um, you know, that you, you want a little bit of skill in the people that takes it a bit of training. Um, you're curing it um, in the water and so on, and what does the specification say about curing if you make cubes on site, by the way? Maybe we got to think about that because frequently the guys say to me, um, yeah, but you know, it must be in a, in a curing tank, it must be on site, it must be heated and, and so on. We all know that. Um, is that right? Because in this case, it wasn't. So you know, what, how do we interpret that? We'll get back to that. Crushing in a machine must be calibrated and so on. It must have a correct failure pattern, which frequently isn't looked at. Um, you know, so um, I, I go to many labs, I pick up a cube that's been crushed, and I can see there are horizontal cracks or a crack on the on this face against the plate. And I say, but guys, you know, this will obviously give you a lower result. What have you done about this? And if you haven't noted that, you know, that says that your testing is not correct. Interpret the results correctly. So if we look at cube testing, I would say it's a simple test. Even the T-boy can, can do it. And the problem is it's frequently the T-boy that exactly does that. Um, you know, and don't think that things don't go wrong. We had one case where I came on the site and you know, we had the guy who makes the cubes. And I said to him, so how do you make the cubes? Can you show me? And he says, yeah, yeah, we take the concrete. Because these cubes were varying from um, 60, 70 MPA right down to 50, 1.5. And I said, how, wh what are you doing? And he says to me, no, no. And he smiled and he, he took out a bag of cement. He says, I take a little bit of cement, I put it in here, and then I mix it. I make very strong cubes because that was his instruction, <laughs> make strong cubes. Um, so you'll be amazed. Okay, let's look at the results that we got. So <coughs> cubes made by the contractor, um, that was his own cubes now. Um, he's the one that, of course, um, you know, is supposed to, to defend what he put in the structure. He got 21, 20.1 and 20.8. This is after seven days. So let's say we are supposed to be, um, this is the 35 MPA concrete. Um, you know, look on the left hand side, this is 35 MPA ring beams. Um, seven, seven days. You know, so we got 20, 21 um, MPA. Clearly not going to make it. This is not going to go to 35, um, not, even, not even if you break. Um, you know, this is not going to go to 35, so no. Um, you know, not even if you hope very hard, you're not going to make it. 
Okay, so let's look at the cubes um, you know, that were made for the engineer. This was made by the accredited laboratory. 21.7, 22, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. So we got two cubes. Now some guys say to me, um, I can make two cubes. I'm happy to make two cubes. So, you know, um, because our standard deviation is very low, I make two cubes and I'm happy with that, I live by it. Then why don't you just make one? You, why do you make any? Because the problem is that it's not a valid test result. You might not like it. You don't save money on testing. If you think about the coronavirus, let's save money on testing. So how clever would we be? No. <laughs> you know what? If you want to spend some money, spend the money on the damn testing and get it right. So yes, 21.7, 22.2. Thanks, Johan, for sneezing in your elbow there. I'm very apt for this time of the presentation. Okay, um, you, you can't test two cubes only. For what? To save some money. Two cubes. Are you serious? You know, okay. So anyway, he got very consistent results, or we don't know whether it's consistent or not, because it's 21.7, 22.2. I took the lab on and I said, how dare you guys do this? Because you are an accredited lab, which means this is not a standard test anymore. You, according to the test method, you were supposed to make three cubes. Okay, so the answer to that was very clever. Um, the answer to that is when we get to the testing, it says test the cubes. It doesn't say test three cubes. When you sample and you make it, so sure, you're supposed to make three. But when you test, you just test the cubes. It doesn't say test three cubes. So I said to the guys, okay, so you know, it, does, it does say that you were right in saying so. The question is, did you make three cubes? And he goes, no, we did not. Then you are out of specification because you should have made three cubes. Maybe you would have tested only two, but that in itself would be absolutely stupid. But that's the level to where we go and degrade the discussion to sometimes. Okay, so that is the cement lab cubes were left on site unprotected and they were disregarded because they were left outside, not even in water or nothing. Um, and so that was, um, that was discarded in total. Now, the next question is the, 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 um, the, the ready mix suppliers own process control cubes. Should we submit it? Um, you know, and I frequently said, well, you know, if they pass, yes, if they fail, no. Um, because the people will misinterpret what actually happened. This was not a sample that was taken according to the specification on site from a moving stream up to the first um, 15 or 10 percent of the concrete that left the truck. So, no. Um, you know, so I, in my opinion, you know, the um, process control cubes will help. Um, if they fail, then I would rather disregard them and not use them because it's also possible that the, the other influences might be, might have been too high. So the next step, the engineer ordered Schmidt Hammer results. Remember now he's got seven day results from all three labs that were low. Um, they all tested 21 around for a 35 MPA. So we said, let us do Schmidt Hammer test results. Okay, because we don't know what's going on. Um, watch this, this is interesting. What can be decided on a Schmidt Hammer result according to SANS 10100? It says, now let me just quote somebody who's in the meeting as well, and whose picture I've got on my screen, who said that a Schmidt Hammer. Um, you can be used, um, you, you, you want to say that, you know, you use a Schmidt hammer, you throw it against the wall. If the Schmidt hammer breaks, the concrete is strong, if the wall breaks, and the, um, the, you know, then the, um, of course, you know, the concrete was not okay. <laughs> but there's room for this. Um, the testing by a rebound hammer may be permitted by the engineer to determine relative strengths. That is, if you have some concrete that you can compare it with, as an aid in evaluating the strength of concrete in place or for selecting areas to be called. Watch what it is there for. Such tests, unless properly calibrated and correlated with other test data, shall not be used as a basis for acceptance or rejection. So this is to get a gut feel. Okay, so we're not gonna make a decision based on Schmidt Amos to remove this concrete or replace it or anything um, like that. Okay, so that at least we know. So then, now it was 18 days. The engineer now ordered the crushing of the other cubes to see what the situation was. 
So um, his two cubes must now be crossed, he says, because he's only got two left now because he only had four cubes, two for seven and two for 28, which the lab did to, of course, save some money, which they did. <laughs> so they did. These results also seem to be low. So now here is the results of the 18 days. So we got the seven day results, 21, 22, and then you got the 18 day results, which is now with 28 and 27. 24. The first question is, what do you learn from this? What do you make of this? Because there's no precedent for an 18 day queue. What's the purpose now? To get an impression of whether we should what, draw cause or not, or what? What was the purpose of an 18 day result? Okay, well, this decision was made, um, be it as it may, so we got an 18 day result. So we get 28 and 27.4. So the question is, can this concrete make it to 35? What do you think? After 18 days, well, after seven days, we're supposed to be 65, 70% or so, depending on the type of cement and, and a few factors. But um, you know, so we understand that that should have been in the region of maybe 28 at seven days, we might have made it. 18 days, we got 28, 27.4. Well, this is low. We understand that it's low. How low is it? Is it so low that you want to make a judgment to discard this concrete and not accept it at all? Well, so let's look at the Schmidt Hammer results 25, um, 20, 15, 10, 18, 20. What is that? What do you make of that? This is more than 30 days now. So what do you make of the schmidt results? results? If I had been the engineer, we would say, oh my word, either the guy doesn't know how to use the schmidt or otherwise we have no idea what we've got in here. And I would get really nervous. The question is still, who is guilty of this? We understand the company didn't make it. So the contractor crushes his three cubes, 26.0, 26.9, 25.8. That's what he gets after 28 days. Now, this is about what the engineer's cubes did after about 18 days. So we now know the concrete didn't make it. It clearly didn't make it. It's not close to 35. But wait a minute, can I go back up here uh, and just say, let's look at the engineer's results, um, these two results that we got. Um, 28 and 27.4. The question is, do you think that that could make it? 18 days. Formulate for yourself quickly. Make your opinion. We'll be the judge of this. So this is just to put it in perspective for you. Seven days. The engineers two cubes did 22. The contractor did 20.6. The supplier's process control it was left in the sun and out dry was 21.7. My word, that was actually a reasonable result. The 18-day cube from the engineer did 27.7. The 28 days from the contractor did 26.4. And that's the problem. And that's the problem because how can you, after 20, after 18 days, same lab, same accredited lab, get 27.7 while 28 days is the contract against 26.4. Oh wait, the plot thickens. This is not it. It's always like a murder case. But wait, there's more. Okay, so let's interpret these results. Mistakes will give you lower results. But 27 at 28 days, it can go to 33 after 28 days, around about there. And 33 is within reason you know, of where we would say a, a mistake could have been made. Um, and so on. So I would think that there was reasonable grounds for an appeal to at least look at some cause, specifically in the light of the fact that we got sweet demo results all over the place. The fact that the 28 day results were lower gave grounds for appeal for cause to be drawn. Okay, so I put a picture here of the advocate in question. You will see I wiped out a part of his face. I don't want the legal battle, not with these guys because they're smart and very clever. Um, you know, and, and so I, I'm very, I'm very careful of them. Um, but the reason why I did that um, is because you will see at the back of his cloak, um, you see there, 
that part of his of his cloak. And these are very beautiful what they wear in the court. Um, but that little thing that he's wearing, a little pouch, I asked him, what is that? Just for the interest of it, and some of you might know. Um, and they laughed and he said to me, it's only one on the left hand side, there's not one on the right hand side as well. I said, in the older days, when they had the guys from the town square, you would have the murderer and you have the, um, the, the judge and you would have you know, the plaintiff, you know, the defendant, and you would have, um, you know, and the, the plaintiff would attack this guy. The poor murderer would stand behind his attorney and he would have, he would look, he would, this would be his view, he would have that. So he would stand close to him so that the, people, the judge couldn't even see. Um, you know, that's pretty much like you have in the Christian belief as well. So we stand pretty close to his attorney so that the judge could not see. And then if he, he would then speak, and then if he felt that he had now said enough, um, you know, and he deserves some money, then he would uh, look over his shoulder and the guy had to put some points into the little pouch. He would go chink, 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 and then he would carry on again. This is like a jukebox. You see, this is the older jukebox that we know. Today, it works the same, but just not, we don't put anything in the pouch. Okay, it's, yeah, we put other stuff in other places. <laughs> we put lots of money in cards and in EFTs, but um, not in the pouch anymore. But that is one thing that actually stayed over the years. I found it quite funny, so I put it in here. Okay, so let's look at the weather. 17 to 27 on the day, 35 MPI concrete, four hours to be offloaded. <coughs> We understand that they must have added some water. Um, you know, and I asked the question in the court. I said to the guys, come on, 27 degrees Celsius, 35 MPI, four hours. You added water to the trucks. He says, yes, we did, but only after we took the samples for the cube making. Oh, my word. Okay, so that means there goes the test results. No, but wait a minute. This means that the test results are better than what the concrete is that's on site. Oh my word, so now we sit in the middle of the court case and I go, oh my word, you know, so what we are fighting for is to say the engineers should have brought some cores, but never did. Um, but you know what, these cores probably would have failed because the guys added water, these kids that failed were still actually an optimistic view of what we've got. The contractor admitted then that their cubes were sampled from two different trucks. Excuse me? So what does the specification say? I mean, in another court case that we've had, the judge asked me, he said, why can't we, if you got 18 trucks, why, yeah, 18 trucks, why didn't you sample um, you know, one cube from each truck? Isn't that better? Because then you've got strings for three, seven, 28 days, you know, three cubes each, you know, wouldn't that be better if we did that? Um, you know, why don't you do that? What does the specification say? Um, you're sampling. The engineer's cubes were sampled by the lab. The contractor's cubes were sampled by themselves. They sampled three cubes directly after the engineer's cube. So the seven day results were pretty similar, isn't it? Because of the fact that they, the engineer sampled, or, the engineer sample, the lab sample, the engineer's cubes, and then the contractor sample from the same truck and he sampled these seven day cubes. But then the other three cubes for 28 day strings were sampled later in the day. So that's got no relevance to this, you know, to the other cube because this is a completely different batch. The argument was, but wait a minute, this is all the same concrete, isn't it? It's one big batch of concrete. And we've taken samples out of a big batch of concrete. But that's not what the specifications say. How about if we take one cube from each truck? Isn't that better is what the judge actually asked me. And the specification is quite clear. Each sample, this is out of the spec, one sample being sufficient for three cubes for each testing age. Three cubes, each age. Sorry guys, three cubes. Shall be taken from a different batch of concrete chosen on a random basis. Okay, so that's it. So you can't have three cubes from another truck or three cubes, one cube from each truck and think that that is going to be okay. So the engineer's cubes, only two cubes for seven days and only two for 28 days. He stated that the contractor actually instructed him to do that. Um, that was the lab. So 
I don't understand how the lab would instruct, um, how the contract would instruct the lab to take two cubes for the engineer, and then he makes three cubes for himself. They were sampled by the lab manager personally. No water was added to the truck before sampling took place. Sure, we know that. He took the sample to the lab and he made the cubes there. And the lab says that the spec says crush some cubes, but it does not give you the number. Um, however, they should have made three cubes, even if they only crushed two, which they didn't do, so they were out of spec anyway. But sampling and making cubes says, and I couldn't reach my last sentence there. Um, there's other stuff on my screen now. Um, um, okay. Um, the contractor's cubes, these were made and cured on site. They were cured for six days um, on site. Okay. They did not have a heater tank. They didn't have a heater tank, but they had it in water. What does the spec say about that? And most of the guys say, come on, guys, you must heat the cubes. Okay. Now, in this case, the photograph there is, um, you know, we found it on the site. Um, I don't want to tell you where it was, um, one of the power stations, but um, there's some cubes in the drum with no water in, and we also, that's not okay. The spec says, protected for 24 hours. Okay, then on-site, prolonged, in water, okay, preferably at 22 to 25, preferably. And they say prolonged. So they don't say how long is pro prolonged. You know, is six days prolonged or not? Six days is definitely um, way prolonged, I would say. Um, but then you're supposed to put it in water. You know, so that's what the guys did. They put it in water. Um, they just didn't heat it. Can I say that's wrong? No, it's not. So that's acceptable. We understand. But if you test it after seven days, you're going to get a lower result. You must expect that at least. What about when tests vary? Two accredited lab vary by eight MPA. This is another case that I was involved with. Um, and the answer to that is, if you have two accredited labs vary by eight MPA, except the higher one, they're more likely to be correct because of the fact that if you make a mistake, you will get a lower result. Um, that's 90% sure, in my opinion, even higher. Um, so you know, I, would, I would then go um, with a higher result, not the lower one. Engineers would tend to go for the pessimistic View because they're the ones who have to sign it off. The engineer's decision, and we're almost through, no cause. Um, the cubes are way too far off the mark, he says, and um, you know, knowing what I know now, I will almost agree with him, but knowing what he knew at the time, he did not know. And you know, with those cubes after 18 days, sitting at 27 and so on, I would have drilled course to actually check what we've got on site. That would have been a, a way better decision, in my opinion. Sweet Hammer results confirmed this, um, you know, that they were way off the mark. In, 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 so he actually said that cast the new ring beam on top of the old one, and then the ready mix supply will pay for this. And that you cannot do. You cannot go and do that. So core results. Let's just look at why I actually say that I think that core results would have been the better option. Where so require, according to the spec, drill cores shall be obtained and tested in accordance with the SANS 5865. Cores shall be drilled and tested when the age of the concrete is as close as possible to the age for strength um, acceptance according to the cubes. The principle, you cannot chase up costs on somebody else's account without notifying them. If a man makes a mistake, you have to give him a chance to rectify this. I know a few guys who've made some mistakes. Um, and whose wives did not. Okay, let me not go into that. But um, you know, if a man makes a mistake, you have to give him a chance to rectify it. I know some of you are laughing and some of you are thankful, but um, this is the principle in the law. Okay, so the same ready mix supply and all should have actually been given the chance to rectify. Maybe you, know, you change some rules. Maybe you say, come up with a higher strength concrete to give us the peace of mind or so, but you've got to give him a chance to rectify it. You can't go and get somebody else and buy concrete at twice the price, and now you want to claim it from this guy. Unfortunately not. Okay, so um, let me tell you a little story, and with that, we're going to conclude. Um, you, I will, I, um, a man goes to a shopping center, and you park your car there, and here comes a lady, and she dents your door. Okay, here comes another guy and dents the door. Here comes whatever. And then your door. Okay. 
So you take your car to the panel beater and the panel beater fixes your car and he spray paints the door and you're very happy. Saturday evening, you have a braai, all the, all the friends are there. That was before lockdown. You have a braai, all your friends are there. A couple of them with a couple of beers in the hand, they stand there and the one guy comes through and looks at your car and says, very happy to see your car is back, but this door is not the same car. And you look and you say, what do you mean? He goes, hey, now you can see this, they painted this different color. It doesn't look the same. And you go and you stand there and you go and say, hey, now that I look at it, you know what? <laughs> it looks like it's not the same color to me as well. So here comes another guy and he says, wait, wait, I've got a cell phone app. You know, you're supposed to have it with this and that conditions, but don't worry. Let's take a picture of this. He goes, yeah, yeah, you know what? This app is not in the same light and so on, but it's not accredited, but I can tell you. My test result, here yeah, says it's not the same color. The other guy says, my father was a, was a photographer in the 1950s. He's got a photometer. Let's go and get that. It's not calibrated, but it's, it's not the same color. You've been screwed. And you are now very upset. So you take your car and do what? You go to another panel beater and you say to him, I wanted to sandblast my whole car, spray paint the whole damn thing so that we get rid of this problem. And then you build that other panel beater for all of it. And that is wrong. That you cannot do. And the problem is now that whether the, the door was the same color or not is not even relevant anymore. Because what you did is so far removed from what is correct that the fact that the, the door was not the same color or was is not even relevant anymore. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how concrete that fails wins a court case because of the fact that you cannot you cannot go and be unreasonable in the way in which we apply specifications and do the testing summary and then we're done there were grounds for appeal for cause in my opinion the engineer made a mistake to deny this and he should have been corrected by the contractor or by anybody else if i'd been involved i would have done that by this time, we didn't know about the testing that had gone wrong, about water that was added to the trucks. We didn't know any of those. With what we knew at the time, we should have brought some cause. There was a reasonable appeal, in my opinion. The low Schmidt-Dammer results were probably correct, but we could not have known that. But that, the variability of that should have been an indication as well that something is wrong either in the testing or in the concrete. And the course would have failed probably due to the water that was added, um, but then the course were never taken. The total lack of proof and acceptance of the engineer's decision lost the case, um, and that eventually won it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, I do want to um, advocate we are running an engineer's course for professional engineers for CPD points next week, Tuesday and Wednesday, the 21st and 22nd of April. If you want to book for that, um, info at go-consult, we will send you an invoice and we will send you all the information of the course. We also do the ICT course, the stage one to four, that's the Institute of Concrete Technology in London, all the stages, and we're going to do them online if you're interested, you know, because that can be taken, the stage four is the ACT, the Advanced Concrete Technology course, um, and we, um, well, we also will do that um, you online, um, you um, in the groups and in the method in which we do that. Um, so we at least from our from our academy, um, I must say we had at least the worldwide top student on the ACT course, of which I'm very proud. Um, you know, and quite a good pass rate um, for the guys who have done all that. I um, would like to invite you to please come and let us know about the course, and we will see. Um, you know, we would love to see you um, on the course as well. Um, and with that, thank you very much for your time and patience. I hope you found it interesting. And the next time we will deal with some of the on-site crises that we deal with from time to time. I thank you. Thank you very much, Jacques. Uh, Jacques, I think there's, uh, there are a few questions that, uh, that came through. So if I am um, just before uh, we go on to the other niceties, uh, I had a question that asked, are you allowed to produce a SANAS accredited test report as a laboratory if the test does not comply to the standards like it was in this presentation that two cubes were tested on 28 days instead of three? 
if you do that, um, you know, this is the SANAS requirement. Um, if you if you do a test that is a, not the standard test, and of course, you're an accredited laboratory, which means your systems are accredited in the way in which you do it, and all your machines are calibrated, and the people are trained, and all of those things are in place. Um, so your SANAS logo can still be on the test result. However, you must then state um, that this test is a non-standard test. Um, you know, the same way in which, and when I was at the Concord Institute many years ago, um, you know, that was still the CNCI at the time, um, you know, I can still re clearly remember that we would do a certain test, um, a few tests or so, and then interpret the test result. And you would clearly put a thing there that says um, you know, the opinions here, um, you know, or the interpretations of the test result are not covered in the accreditation of the test. So you can have that test with a SANAS logo on top of the lab because the lab is a SANAS accredited lab. So long as you state and you say, this is two cubes, this is a non-standard test, it deviates from the specification in that only two cubes instead of three were tested at every age. Then it is all admissible. Um, then at least somebody who takes this cube result will then look at that and they, will, they can understand where it is not actually meeting the specification. Okay, then uh, there was another one, Jacques, uh, that uh, can you produce a test report uh, under, with the SANAS logo on your report if you are not accredited for that test? I think we, we all understand that laboratories are accredited for specific tests. So if somebody is, uh, for instance, accredited to do, uh, to do sampling of concrete, but not specifically the making of the cubes, or the testing of the cubes, um, can they still put a cube test result on a report that's got the SANAS logo on it? Uh, yeah, the, the principle is still what makes logical sense. Um, you are not supposed to, to mislead anybody. Anybody who takes your test report must look at the test report and then and from that very quickly be able to interpret exactly what you have done and which of this was done under the accreditation. You know, the accreditation goes as far as that I can use another accredited lab to do part of the test under their accreditation or even under my accreditation, so long as I state, clearly state, what happened. Now, you know, the guy that I know that is probably the quickest in taking a test result and then interpreting that result is probably my partner, Yaku. I haven't seen somebody that is as quick to take a result and say, that's wrong, this is wrong, that's not right, that's not right. Um, you know, but you must, you must then, you cannot mislead the reader of your report. That, that person who looks at that, you know, who looks at the test result must clearly know that this lab is accredited for this, for that, for that, for that. So you will see that in a cube report where the, the people make the cubes on site, and in this case, the contractor made his own cubes, left it on site, sent it to the lab. Did the lab make a mistake? No, the lab said these cubes were received on a certain date. They were made, sampled, made by the contractor and not by us. Um, and you know, so and we made the cubes, um, and we received the cubes, we crossed it under the accreditation. The lab who samples, if they're not accredited for sampling, um, I, you know, most of the guys, if they accredited for cube testing, they would be accredited for the sampling as well. Um, but if they were not accredited for that, they should say, sample, not under the accreditation, um, you know, but the cube testing was done under the accreditation. That, there must be a remark. There's a space for that on every report, or there should be a space for that in an, every test report. Okay, and then, uh... Jacques, so in the end, who is accountable? You know, if the, if the contractor added water, uh, even if he's signed for it, uh, you know, uh, who is then accountable? You know, if, they, if the test cubes fail uh, and sampled before the water was added, as we had in this case, is, is the ready mix supplier still, still responsible to strengthen or replace the concrete? Johan, I know that you know the answer. Thanks for asking the question for the benefit of everyone else. Um, um, you know, it is, um, of course, um, you know, the, it is responsibility of the contractor to give concrete, um, you know, his contract with the, with the engineer is that he will actually provide the concrete that will meet the specifications so that the structure will be stable 
um, and safe according to what the engineer actually stated and what he requires. Um, you know, if some if he allows somebody to add some water to the trucks, um, you know, then he's not giving the contract, he's not giving the, the client what he actually is buying. All right, so if he's adding water to the trucks, he takes a responsibility for that. Um, the ready mix supplier has got the responsibility to bring the concrete to the site in the correct um, you know, proportions and to actually meet the specification. The potential strength of the concrete must be according to what um, is what is specified. Okay, so if the water is added, um, you know, that's why the ready mix supplier should actually get the contractor to sign if he adds any water. Contractor says, but the concrete is too dry, I'm adding water to get it out of the truck. No, send it back, or, you know, phone the ready mix supplier and tell him, what do you want to do? I can't get your concrete out of the truck. Remembering that your slump test, if you want to perform it, must be done within 30 minutes after the concrete arrived on site. That means slump test should run as the trucks arrive on site within 30 minutes. Because after that, the, the um, responsibility for concrete that does not make the slump, um, the, you know, must, does not meet the slump requirements, passes over to the contractor. So they must understand that. So, um, you know, if the guys add water, whoever adds the water is the one that must take responsibility for it. The ready mix supplier will insist that, the, the, and should insist that the contractor actually signs for the water to accept the responsibility for changing the mix design in the truck. Okay, if he doesn't want to do that, then don't add the water and you, um, that, then you, because that will be stupid. Don't add the water, send the truck back, let the responsibility sit where it's supposed to sit and that's where the ready mix supplier. Okay, so there's no forgiving um, for it. You're saying that we took the samples before and that is so dangerous because he was misleading the people. He knew that he was weakening the concrete. That's why he made the statement. But taking the samples before, actually, uh, yeah, before he actually added the water, that says that there was almost criminal intent because he knew that he was weakening the concrete. He was still happy to sell it to the client like that. That is almost, that's where a criminal element lies in my opinion. Uh, Jacques then, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I've also had a question from Paul Fisher and Paul asks, uh, would borehole water have an impact on the MPA, on, on the, the concrete strength? It depends on what's in the borehole um, and what's in the borehole water. Um, you know, we should have a test that um, normally the, the misconception is that if you have some salts, um, you know, brackish water or salt in the water, that that would have an effect. Um, mostly salt will, if anything, accelerate the concrete. Um, but the problem is that the salts and stuff in the water will in all likelihood then attack if there's chlorides or so in it, that will attack your steel and can corrode the steel. If you have other things like sulfates and so on in the water, that can also have an effect, magnesium or stuff like that. You know, the, the idea is there's a specification, a simple specification now to test the water. So go and test the water and look at the dissolved solids, look at the organics because organics will retard it, look at the color, um, you taste it for sugar. If you're not prepared to taste it, then don't um, use it um, because concrete is an intelligent material. Don't insult the concrete. If you're not prepared to drink the water, then don't put it in the concrete, okay? Um, but um, you know, it is a simple couple of tests that one can do, and then you make some control cubes, and you make cubes with a, um, with a suspect water as well as control cubes, so you compare the two, and the specification clearly states um, what that must be. Uh, thank you. I think uh, uh, Tato says something that is very important. I think th that everybody needs to realize that the slump needs to be done within 30 minutes of the truck arriving on site. Not 30 minutes from when you're ready for discharge and we see the truck standing outside and, and just spinning. Um, so that's a very valid comment. And I think there's something else that goes along with it is that uh, many times the ready mix supplier also fails to remix the concrete before discharge and before the concrete actually gets tested. And so, uh, you know, and, and I know that this is something that I did learn from you, but that we're trying to say to ready mix suppliers, spin the truck for five minutes at high revs before you take a sample from the truck or before discharge starts. 
and the drum must never be stationary on a ready mix drug. Um, correct. And, you know, the, the concept is that you want a representative sample that is representative of what is actually in the truck. Um, that, that's what you're supposed to test. So then in, in conclusion, and if I, I don't see any more questions, uh, then in conclusion, I'd just like everybody to know uh, this is a series that we are going to, uh, to be running. We are going to get some information from Jacques, and, and I know that, uh, that uh, both uh, Brian, Gary, and, um, and John from the Concrete Institute, they would also like to get in on this. And this is for information for anybody that is ever working with concrete. Guys, so if you need that information, please log on to the Concrete Trends website and subscribe to uh, the Digimag and to our newsletters. That's where you're going to get uh, the updates of when these webinars will be running. And on the side, I've just spoken to Henry Cockcroft from the Concrete Manufacturers Association so that we can, we can also run uh, a webinar on certification and, and SANAS accreditation just so that uh, we can explain that more. All of this is just to add to the quality of concrete, or if I can say the perceived quality of concrete, that we get the tests right and everybody follow the responsibility when it, uh, when it comes to testing concrete and using concrete. So Jacques, in short, actually I want to put you out of business because if everybody gets the concrete right, then um, we won't have, uh, we won't have uh, presentations like these anymore. Johan, can I say that when I joined the Institute in 1991, um, I said to my wife, you know, we're gonna, it's going to take us three years to train everyone. Um, and after that, I will, the, the Institute will probably fire me because I would not be able to train anybody because everybody will know. So that was in 1991. Look at where we are now, 2020. <laughs> and you know what? We haven't, we, I think that we are, we didn't make any progress, certainly. I think that we are back um, on the level of knowledge that we have in our country, if I have to make an assessment of that. <laughs> so we're not, we're not moving forward. And if you are training on concrete, I don't think that you'll ever be without a job. You know, certainly might not, might be that the people don't want to pay for the training, but that they need it. Mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> Sorry, well, um, uh, Jacques, yes. can I, uh, Jacques, Nicholas McDermott speaking. I'm, um, I'm right hand man to, uh, to, to Johan. I've just started with the company. I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. I attended recently one of these online uh, webinars, and uh, it was quite a big to do. And it was, you know, it, it was, it was um, live from Saudi Arabia, and it was fair enough. It was a good deal, but I can tell you. Your presentation, you outdid them all. I was very, very impressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And, and just for everybody else's benefit, um, Nick is also producing some editorial for us for Concrete Trends uh, as the publishing editor of Concrete Trends. So you're going to see some more news uh, on these type Indeed. of case studies and, um, and we'll be working through them. And then just to answer one last question before we go off, uh, Kulakani Mtlongu has asked if there are any courses available for the small contractors who lack the knowledge of handling concrete on site. And the answer to this is Kulakani, there is a lot of courses. There are a lot out there. And I know that Jacques do them and I know that the Concrete Institute does them. Uh, we have got John Roxburgh. So Kulakani, you are welcome to contact me directly and uh, I'll direct you to... Uh, to go consult and to the Concrete Institute and to the Concrete Manufacturers Association and even the Concrete Society of Southern Africa that continuously uh, have got uh, knowledge sharing opportunities for everybody. So, and together we can, uh, we uh, work together in bringing the knowledge to the SMMEs. And, and I think just as a last thought from, from DMG and, and Concrete Trends, Remember that we're all in this together and we really, we want to bring the knowledge to the industry. That's the only way that we're going to grow this industry. If we get everybody to, uh, to know what to do with concrete and to support our growing contractors on site. And once we do that and we don't have to do jobs mm -hmm. over or replace or strengthen concrete, we will have more money available to build new infrastructure and house more people. And that's the drive from a DMG and a concrete trains point of view. 
And I'm sure that Jacques and, and, and Brian, you guys will agree with that. Let's, uh, let's get the knowledge out there. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I can see from, from the group chat that uh, people are, uh, did enjoy this. Uh, there's been a lot of thank yous. And just to answer the last question, yes, uh, this webinar was recorded. Uh, the webinar will also be edited now, uh, and then it will be available for access with Jacques Smith's uh, um, uh, approval on that. And then, uh, and then you would be able to, uh, to see it again. But uh, do know that this is, this is a series. Uh, you can't just watch the one over and over. Uh, you're going to have to need some more information and, and uh, we will have more people on here from a Concrete Trends uh, point of view. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Subscribe to Concrete Trends, get all the information, and we will see you on the next webinar. Thank you very much.